Hi, and welcome to our talk on sharing our knowledge to create a Blackfoot learning resource. We're going to begin our presentation today with an introduction and a prayer in the Blackfoot language. The video just watched is of Ikinomotstan Noreen Breaker, a Siksika elder and a first language speaker of Blackfoot. She introduced our talk with a prayer to bring good things to our work and to this conference. And she also explained how our title reflects the conference theme of recognizing relationships. Noreen's a graduate of the University of Calgary, and she has a long history of collaborating with linguists on Blackfoot language projects. In this video, she's joining us from her home territory on the Siksika Nation in Treaty 7 territory in Southern Alberta, Canada. And this is Natopi Lee Breaker. He's Noreen's son and he's a member of the Siksika Horn Society. He's a second language learner of the Blackfoot language and he too is living and working on the Siksika Nation. This is Leanne Ireland. She's mixed race Anishinaabe and she's from the central Ontario area. She's a graduate of Trent University where she has a degree in Indigenous Studies and she's been the executive director of the Urban Society for Aboriginal Youth since 2008. Leanne's currently residing in central Ontario, which is the traditional land of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And today, this territory is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Finally, I'm Heather Bliss. I was born and raised in Treaty 7 territory in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and my family's of Scottish and British descent. I'm trained as a linguist, and I've been collaborating on Blackfoot language projects with Noreen, Lee, and others from the Siksika and Kainai Nations for nearly 20 years. I'm joining you today from the fishing village of Steveston, which is on the west coast of Canada, on the traditional and unceded territories of the Hunkaminam speaking Coast Salish peoples. And aloha. We really wish we could be gathering all together in Hawaii, but we're nevertheless very grateful to our hosts there for bringing us together in this digital space. Noreen and I feel very lucky to have attended ICLDC two years ago, and we're channeling the energy and the spirit of the ICLDC conference in this work. So I'll start by just giving you an overview of our talk today. So our objective really is to reflect on our collaboration, the four of us, to develop a Blackfoot graphic novel with an augmented reality interface. And the main points we'll make throughout this talk are first that code mixed resources like that, which is in our graphic novel, these may be more accessible than monolingual resources for some youth who are reclaiming their indigenous languages. We feel that by modeling code mixing and published resources like a graphic novel, this can help to destigmatize code mixing and it can encourage Blackfoot learners to use their language regardless of their proficiency. 
What we found is that developing code mixed learning resources really required a collaborative approach. And in particular, we want to point out that learners, language learners, play a very valuable role in developing these kinds of resources. So before I talk about the resource itself, I want to talk a little bit about the Urban Society for Aboriginal Youth, or USAI. This is the organization that published our graphic novel. Um, Lien, as I said, is the executive director of this organization, and Noreen, Lee, and I were con contracted by USAI to do this work. So USAI is an Indigenous-led organization working with Indigenous youth ages 12 to 29 in the city of Calgary. And they follow a strengths-based approach in their work. So they have a variety of programming that supports Indigenous youth to achieve their own versions of success. They focus on fun activities that engage technology, art, and culture to build resiliency and support successful transitions to adulthood. And USA is a disruptor. So they aim to change ongoing, pervasive, and damaging narratives regarding Indigenous people and young people. And they work towards living and evolving forms of reconciliation. Now, with respect to the resource we developed, this is a graphic novel with an augmented reality interface. It's called Finding Victor in English, and then the Blackfoot name for the novel is Apesam, not, not Victor. So this is the 10th graphic novel published by Yusei, and it's part of Yusei's larger language learning strategy. Uh, the novel is distributed free to educators, community partners, and really anybody who's interested. And the intention really of the graphic novel series, so this one, but the other ones they've developed as well, is to tell stories that are led by Indigenous youth in the community and engage them in language learning that may encourage further interest. So the novels really focus on contemporary themes that will engage and relate to Indigenous youth, but the stories are told in a Blackfoot narrative style. And like I said, there's an augmented reality interface. So this is really part of a larger language learning package where schools can utilize a virtual reality escape room, uh, the graphic novel itself, which is available in print form and also an animation that's available on YouTube. And this is all freely available to schools and others who are interested. Now, with respect to code mixing in the novel, the novel is written with this code mix text. So it incorporates aspects of both English and Blackfoot. And I've given you just one small screenshot from the animation there. So you can see that most of it is written in English, but there are bits that are also in Blackfoot. The Blackfoot parts of the text are always in a different color. So in this case, red, and then a loose English translation is given in brackets. Now, the reason why we did a code mix text for language learning as opposed to something that was monolingually Blackfoot, the reason why is that most Blackfoot youth weren't raised in the language. So we really want to engage youth, and in some cases youth who really haven't had language learning opportunities before, we want to engage them in the language and engage them in the possibility for um, more language learning. So we feel that a monolingual Blackfoot text might be inaccessible to many learners. And our guiding principle in doing this work was that we wanted to combine English phrases with Blackfoot power words to teach culturally significant vocabulary. So in this case here, this one that translates Lucy to something like you still have a home is, is sort of a salient word in the text. Now I want to play you an excerpt from the animation from the graphic novel. The whole thing is about 12 minutes long. I'm just gonna play a small sample here and I've given you the YouTube link if you're interested in watching the whole thing. The youth worker commiserates. Hey, I know the feeling. Like you don't belong here, right? Well, you do. It takes practice and time. It's such a big one. You belong, and if you don't know something, Victor reconsiders, thinking to himself, maybe this isn't so bad. I could try. The mountains, mistakes, the trees, Mix cheeks, the colors in the sky. He says to himself, Now I hope that that small excerpt sort of piqued your interest so that you'll go watch the whole animation. And I hope too, actually, that this really reflected sort of our larger objective, um, embodied our larger objective, which was to honor the language, the Blackfoot language, um, and the culture and ensure that the text flows in a natural way that makes sense to Blackfoot speakers and learners. 
So we found that this really required a collaborative approach to do this, and we really needed to draw on our complementary bodies of knowledge, the four of us. There's, is, it isn't the case that just one of us could have completed this work on our own. We really needed to all work together. Now I want to tell you more about what our respective roles were in the project, but I want to sort of overlay the whole thing by telling you that, like many of you, I'm sure we faced unexpected challenges in doing this work due to the pandemic. So we had originally planned to meet in person and get this done in a very small time frame, but instead we ended up having weekly conference calls over a five month period. Um, it wasn't possible for us to get on Zoom or use you know, some other um, online platform just due to internet and technology issues. So we were working over the phone, which you know, can make it challenging for communication. Um, we also had some complicated arrangements for the audio recording and the editing. So we had technology that needed to get from point A to point B and that involved some, some complicated work. Um, but but you know, we, we finally achieved this project and we're really proud of the outcome. So I do want to tell you more about what all four of us did in this work. So I'll begin with Leanne. So like I said, Leanne is the executive director of USAI. And so she has, you know, over a decade of experience supporting Blackfoot youth, in particular using the strengths-based approach that USAI follows. Um, Finding Victor is their 10th graphic novel. And so she has a lot of experience putting the strength-based approach to work in graphic novel development. She also has a lot of experience using technology, technology to engage Indigenous youth in language learning. So Leanne was responsible for project management overall. She also wrote the first draft of the text all in English, and she oversaw the final production of the graphic novel and the assorted technologies that went along with it. As for Noreen, She's a first language Blackfoot speaker. She has lots of experience in Blackfoot language teaching. She's done a lot of translation work and she's worked on a number of Blackfoot language documentation projects as well. So all of these skills were very useful in this work. She's a Siksika elder and knowledge keeper. And so she brought to this project her knowledge of how to make things authentic and culturally relevant. So her task overall was to identify the power words in the text. So as we went through the text line by line, she would find places where we could put Blackfoot, Blackfoot in, where we would include Blackfoot power words. And she provided guidance on the meaning and the pronunciation of Blackfoot vocabulary. Now, as for Lee, as I said before, he's a second language learner of Blackfoot. Um, so he's working on developing his proficiency. And as part of that, he's a very frequent code mixer, as a lot of learners are. Um, so it isn't the case that you know very proficient and older speakers of Blackfoot don't code mix, but Lee might do so to a larger degree than some of the more proficient speakers. Um, like Noreen, he's a Siksika elder and knowledge keeper, which with lots of um, insights and expertise to share about Blackfoot traditions and Blackfoot culture. So what he did when we were going through the text is he advised on the integration of Blackfoot vocabulary. So we might find a place where we wanted to put in a Blackfoot power word and he would sort of figure out where it should go and how that should be sort of combined with the English to get the phrasing to work in a very authentic way. He also recorded the voiceover for the augmented reality interface. So that bit of um, animation that I showed you a few slides back, that was Lee's voice that you heard there. Now, finally, as for me, I have expertise in the linguistic aspects of Blackfoot, and I've also done some research on code mixing. Um, so I was able to advise on and how to integrate all of these pieces effectively. Um, I have expertise in the Blackfoot orthography, and I've done linguistic field work for a long time. Um, so I collaborated with Noreen and Lee to create the code mix text. And then after we had that code mix text all developed, I transcribed all of the Blackfoot words in the text so that we could have the written version for the novel. Um, Lee had not previously worked with audio recording technologies, uh, so I guided him through that audio recording process while I was on the phone with him. And then after that was done, I edited and compiled the audio version of the text. So, you know, this really was important that we get it right. Um, we couldn't just sort of plug in any Blackfoot word and put it sort of anywhere and come up with a product that would that would represent the language and the, the community in a fair and uh, authentic way. So really to get it right, we had to pay attention to features of code mixing. So code mixing is a salient feature of contemporary Blackfoot speech. I mentioned already that learners often code mix, but in fact, all Blackfoot speakers code mix and the difference is just in matter of degree. So what I found in my research earlier 
earlier research is that regardless of a speaker's age or language proficiency, code mixing tends to follow consistent grammatical patterns. They all do similar things. It's just that some people do it even more. Um, so ensuring that these kinds of patterns, these patterns that really sort of characterize Blackfoot and Blackfoot mixed with English, ensuring that these patterns were replicated in the text was really important to us. So we wanted to foster a sense of authenticity with the final project. And we, of course, wanted to honor Blackfoot language and culture. Now, we're hoping that our work is really sort of contributing to the destigmatization of code mixing. So we felt that by, by producing a language learning resource that wasn't entirely monolingual, um, we can achieve this goal of sort of getting learners to um, not be so worried, perhaps, about code mixing when they're, when they're learning and using Blackfoot. So the fact is, is that intergenerational transmission of the Blackfoot language is decreasing. And there's many younger community members who are self-reported semi-speakers or learners. And the fact is, is that their language abilities are sometimes regarded negatively by elders. Now, I think this largely comes from a position of fear where the elders are worried about language loss. And so they really want the younger generation to get it right. Um, so code mixing, of course, is one of the many strategies that learners employ when they're learning the language and when they're using the language. Like I said, learners are not the only ones who do this, but they tend to do it to a larger degree. They tend to use more English in their speech. And, you know, although everybody does it, under the threat of language loss, code mixing may be perceived as a stigmatized form of expression. It may be seen as, you know, not the pure language. So we're thinking that by producing a resource, a book that you can hold in your hand, um, all of these assorted technologies with this code mix text, then it can really contribute to the destigmatization of code mixing. It sort of helps to normalize it and almost give it some, you know, some uh, credence by, by having these resources out there. The other thing that we think is important in our project is this aspect of honoring learners. So like I said, our project really required different and complementary types of expertise. It isn't the case that one of us could have achieved the goals of this project on our own. We all had to work together. And in particular, what we needed was a proficient speaker. So in this case, it was Noreen. And we needed a learner. So in this case, Lee. And both of their contributions were equally valuable in creating authentic and engaging language learning resources. So we really needed the contribution of the learner to see where we would code mix and how to do it in a very authentic way. Now, what we'd like to point out is that in the language revitalization and language documentation work, there's often this idealized notion of speaker as being the fluent L1 speaker. You know, that's often who we're seeking out when we're trying to do language documentation, for example. Um, and, you know, this notion has been challenged by other authors who come before us, but I think that our project also challenges that notion by recognizing the important contributions of learners. So as we're thinking of developing language revitalization resources, it's important to honor the learners and acknowledge the expertise that they can bring to the project by virtue of them being learners. So just in closing, I want to comment on the theme of the conference and how our work fits into that theme. So, you know, we really hope that we've created a valuable Blackfoot language learning resource. Um, we hope this will be use, useful to Blackfoot youth in Treaty 7 territory. Um, but of course, like a lot of projects, it's not just about the final product, but also about the process. So I think through doing this work together, we've really had a strengthening of our team's relationships. Um, Noreen and Lee and I in particular have worked together for a very long time. Um, but, you know, we really had to think carefully about this project. It was a different sort of thing than what we're used to doing. And especially because of the pandemic, um, we had to develop some good workflow and work through challenges that came with doing things at a distance. Um, also, we had a chance really, you know, through this, this sort of slow week by week process of doing this and through really trying to establish these good workflows, I think we reached um, a deeper understanding of the roles we play in our work together. And so we've had some great outcomes to this project, not only in terms of the product, but also in terms of the process. And that process really recognizes our relationships to each other. So thank you very much for listening to this presentation. I'd like to remind you that you can join us for the synchronous Q&A on March 5th, and you can connect with us in other ways as well as I've given here. And if you're interested in learning more about the Finding Victor project, I've given you some links as well. Thank you. <laughs>